So I'll try to make this quick, not uh, take away more of your break time. I'm Rahul Jadav. Uh, so this is regarding system call improvement for network IO. Uh, OK. So the primary motivation for us was uh, the gaming scenario where uh, we were experimenting with a particular game which made use of UDP packets. Uh, so uh, to improve the latency, we made use of multipath UDP. In a, uh, and eventually, we realized that on the server, we are not able to scale very well when we are using multipath UDP uh, scheme. So what happened was there were multiple. Uh, so we, what we tried to check was whether receive M message uh, can be made use of in, the, in this particular context and see whether it can give any improvement. And to, uh, what we realized eventually is that receive M message couldn't get any, any, any improvement. So we tried to analyze why, and we saw that there were multiple small sized packets across multiple sockets, especially for the gaming scenario. If we had both TCP and UDP sockets, the packet rate characteristic, the, the throughput per connection was very less. But having said that, there were thousands of connections, uh, gaming connections on the server side. Reverse proxies, so the, the, I'm, I'm basically talking about the motivation for this work. Uh, we are extending three system calls. One is the receive message, another is the send message, and the third one is the receive low watt extension. So uh, this is the motivation. Another motivation was multipart transport, especially the multipart multi transports which are implemented in the user space. Uh, which requires send on multiple sockets, which may require send on multiple sockets at the same time. So, uh, just a quick, uh, uh, just a quick uh, uh, recap of the receive progression. So, I'm going to talk about receive message, uh, uh, MM message. So, this is th this is the new thing that we are trying to do. So, what it does is we already have a receive a message, which sort of tries to uh, get multiple messages from the same sockets in the same system call. What we are trying to do here is try to batch multiple sockets and try to receive packets across these sockets in the same system call. We found that there is a lot of uh, CPU overhead when it comes to system call uh, usage of these system calls. So we, we, we are just extending the receive M message. To receive MM message, the new M here stands for Doing, do, do, doing receive message, M message across multiple sockets. Okay, and just to give a pictorial representation of what we are trying to do here, uh, we have received a message which in a single system call can receive across multiple sockets. We don't have any API which does that currently, uh, uh, the, the, but this is essentially what we are trying to do. Uh, I, I can't get into the details of the comparison here. So uh, the receive message, receive M message, and the receive MM message. So in case of receive M message, you can pull multiple packets on the same socket in the same system call. Here, we can do it across the sockets. So uh, the user space changes. What, what, what Already, if you see, the kind of APIs we, which we have, uh, the epoll, epoll weight, it already gives you an indication of the events that are received across sockets. What we are trying to do here is we are trying to pull in all these events, put, put, uh, batch all these socket descriptors, and then make a single uh, system re uh, receive a message call, receive MM message call. Inside the kernel, the implementation is pretty straightforward, for, uh, especially for the receive MM message, because we are primarily wrapping up the existing receive MM message calls, which takes care of security and all the other handling. Uh, so in the user. In the user space, what changes is that before making a receive call, you, you batch all the FDs together and then make a single receive MM message call. The primary complexity that we found was with regards to the error handling across sockets. How do you report errors across multiple sockets? How do you, how do, you uh, uh, do sockets to message map, messages mapping? So that was the primary complexity here, but uh, otherwise, it was. We, uh, otherwise it was pretty straightforward. We primarily used the non-blocking mode. In fact, the MM message extensions that we are talking about here only works with the non-blocking mode of usage. The send MM message again works in the similar fashion. It is wrapped 
across send a message uh, internally. But the advantage here is that in case of multipath, user space multipath transport, you can have the same message vector to be sent across multiple FDs. So you can essentially have overlapping message vectors that, are, that, that, that can be sent across multiple sockets here. You can also have partially overlapping messages. Theoretically, it is possible, but I don't know of any use case where it can be made use of uh, right now. Again, the gaming scenario with using MPUDP, we made use of uh, the, the redundant scheduler wherein the same packet was sent across multiple sockets was the use case here. A word about syscalls, a quick, uh, uh, the, the overhead is in terms of two different costs, the direct cost and the indirect cost. The direct cost, which is actually the mode switching cost, which involves switching from ring zero to ring three and vice versa. The indirect cost is the result of processor state pollution, wherein there will be, ad uh, there will be additional translation look aside buffer lookups and the cache coherency issues that might arise out of the system call issue. So we were trying to tackle these two system call overheads. In this talk, I'm primarily co going to concentrate, concentrate upon the, uh, the direct cost. The d indirect cost, having said that, the indirect cost is the major cost with regards to system call uh, utilization, uh, use of system calls. The direct, so these are some of the numbers. Uh, we had a UDP server. Uh, here, the N, is essentially what is returned from the epoll weight. The N tells you what kind of batching is, uh, is done, can be achieved. So if you see where, when it goes, so if you have a lot of user space processing in the application, the N increases uh, substantially. This is the return value of the epoll weight. In this case, what you can do, you, you can see what receive M message, M message is not able to get enough of batching improvement because there were not many packets received on the same socket. But there was a lot of packets received across the sockets. So you can reduce the system call overhead with receive MM message as compared to receive M message. So in this case, we found that the CPU cycle utilization was like almost 14% less in, in context to uh, the receive MM message. Now again, I have to stress here that this is the direct cost or the direct overhead that I'm talking of only. This can increase substantially with the indirect cost, uh, which means what happens if the processor state uh, is getting polluted. The perf profile, if you can see, this is a simple uh, receiver test wherein we are just receiving the packet and dropping it. You can see that the most majority of the overhead is with regards to the system call processing. What you can see is with the receive MM message, the system call overhead processing is, uh, is much less as compared to the receive MM message. Naturally, we are getting a very high rate of batching. This, the, the batching rate that we are getting in this case is approximately 30. Are there any existing alternatives? Well, that's, yes, there are uh, existing alternatives in the form of asynchronous IO, which is already there in the Linux kernel. But having said that, it's not very easy to use at the moment. You have, you have to, uh, it's much more difficult than what we are trying to propose, essentially. But one, one interesting thing about uh, the asynchronous IO is that you can group read and write system calls together as well. So the, that, is, that is an additional improvement that you get with uh, AIO. Another improvement that we want to talk, uh, I want to talk about here is the receive low watt impro improvement. So what is receive low watt? Uh, there is a low watermark that can be set in the kernel before the poll-in event or the e-poll-in event is, uh, is set by the kernel for that particular socket. So uh, the, the primary problem that we faced in this context was that there was no way of setting the timeout. So what happens if we want a low watermark to be th uh, to be to be set, and then we want a timeout to happen if enough data is not received. Right now, the timeout can be can, can be used only with the receive time uh, with this this particular this particular socket option. But this socket option works only with if you are directly calling the receive from or the receive API. This socket option doesn't work for sockets which are used alongside ePoll. So if you, if you are waiting on a ePoll wait, and if you have set a receive low watt, unless and until the low watermark is hit, you won't be able to receive any event. What that means is if you have a buffer and for some reason the TCP connection 
or uh, the TCP connection reduces the rate or doesn't fill up the packet, you won't get an event, even if uh, even if there is uh, even if the timeout has occurred. So what we had done is essentially this: we have introduced a way of adding a timeout along with the receive low wet option. What it means is that along with the receive low wet, you can set a timeout. And if there are no packets, or if, the, if there is any packet, if there is any data in that particular socket, and if there is a timeout, you will receive an epolin or the polling event. So this, what, what it allows you to do is, you can set more aggressive low, watt, uh, low, low watermark thresholds on your socket, thus reducing the system call eventually. So uh, the concluding remarks, so what we are trying essentially to do is reduce the system call overhead by batching it more uh, across, the, uh, across multiple sockets. We are trying to make sure that the interfaces are easy to use and our primary motivation was to make sure that we can extend existing stacks, for example, the NGINX stack uh, for such, uh, uh, such changes. We want to make sure that the, receive, uh, that the system overhead for the multi-part transport, especially the multi-part transports in the user space is less. And the receive low watt timeout, it allows us to set more aggressive watermarks or the more aggressive thresholds for the watermarks. That's all, that's all from my side, any questions? Yeah, not bad. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I will ask about UDP sockets. How many UDP sockets a particular thread is uh, handling at some So in this point? case, we are using uh, 512 UDP sockets. 500? 12, 512 uh, UDP sockets. Why are you using so many sockets? So, so yeah, that, that's a good question because actually. Because it's in a case huge of server. footprint in the memory of the kernel. So Sorry? It's a huge footprint, memory footprint, correct, just correct. having all these objects in the kernel. So, and having to store an, a, an SKB to a lot of different receive queue is uh, incurring a lot of cache line miss anyway. Right. Uh, regardless of how fast you try to read them right. uh, with a system call. And, and you know, uh, this system call becomes like crazy complex. So I'm not sure that's the right approach to solve your problem So, anyway. uh, so, so the 512 is the total number of UDP sockets that we're talking of. But at any point, the number of events that we are getting is approximately uh, this, the N size. So these are the total number of UDP sockets. Having said that, the use case is not only for the UDP socket, it works equally well for the TCP sockets as well. What we are trying to do is Mm. Oh, sorry, uh, I think this is the slide. So uh, let me just show you this. Yeah. So this structure, this structure is can be controlled by the user. So you have the uh, you can put a limit on the count from the user space application. If you don't want to have that kind of batching, that higher number of batching, then you can reduce this count. Yeah. So I I will repeat my question. If your application is try trying to drain all the receive queue of 500 sockets. Why do you have 500 sockets and, and just one, single one? Oh, yeah, so... Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it would be much faster. Yeah, so <laughs> you, what you're essentially saying is, on the server side, why do you really need 512 sockets? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, in... If That's for a design you, error, I think. Yeah. But for, for, if you consider the case of the reverse proxy, where the UDP, the UDP packets are received on a given socket, and then the client connections are made to the server, to the different server, then you might need multiple sockets. Having said that, for, for, uh, we, in, in our case, we made use of connected UDP sockets because we wanted to manage session directly on the connected UDP so, uh, sockets. So you get an event, you should be able to directly map to the session. But what you're saying is, yes, it is possible that you have only a single UDP server socket. But in case of TCP, this is not possible. Right, okay, yeah. For, for UDP, it is. One quick question. Uh, what if some of these FTs are blocking, some are not? Right. So Is this going to block or not block? So what happens is you are receiving an epolin event on that FD anyways. That's when you batch it up. But I've clearly mentioned here that this works only for the non-blocking mode. So 
there is no point in having certain FDs which are blocking and then batching it up together with the non-blocking FDs. So user space uh, application has to make sure that all are non-blocked. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to, we are into our break, so take a quick break uh, and we'll be back at 10.50.